there's a real mismatch between the real lives of ordinary people. And that's where I'd say the green thing goes wrong because people are just going, you know, you're telling me, um, you know, that I've got the most important thing is net zero and I can't afford to heat my home. You know what I mean? Like what, what? Yeah. There's a, just a, this massive gap and that alienation, that inability for political parties of all sides to have any kind of a relationship or even conversation with people is, I think, really what is the crisis in democratic countries at the moment. Baroness Claire Fox is a member of the House of Lords in Great Britain, and our guest today joins us from London, where there's a lot of activity at the moment. She grew up in Wales, studied literature at the University of Warwick, and went on to have careers in social work and teaching literature. Now, for 20 years, Baroness Fox was an active member of the Revolutionary Communist Party, but she since adopted a far more minimal government stance uh, that some would say is not unlike libertarianism. In April 2019, she became a registered supporter of the Brexit Party and won election with that party to the European Parliament. She's been an advocate of freedom of speech, uh, and national sovereignty against international laws, institutions, and what I've sometimes called the expertocracy that want to tell us all how to live. Baroness Fox was given her peerage in 2020 by the Boris Johnson government, and we're recording this podcast shortly after the announcement of his resignation at a time of great turmoil that is of obvious significance for Britain, but I think has global significance as well. Claire, thank you so much for joining us. For our non-British viewers and listeners, could you start by telling us what is the House of Lords? It's an unusual beast for the rest of us to try and understand. And what do you think its strengths are? How do you, as somebody not always, if you like, associated with the British establishment, feel about being now a baroness and in the House of Lords? So it is an unusual place. It's very, uh, it's the second chamber in the UK and no piece of legislation can be passed without it going through the House of Lords. And the unusual part is that it's not elected. So that's very problematic for somebody who's a Democrat like me. And it's, rightly criticized because it's a huge there's i think almost 800 people in the house of lords they don't all turn up of course but every law that's passed in the commons by the government uh, via the elected house has to come to the house of lords so that's it seems to me its job officially is to scrutinize law is to take another look at it, to go through it, to make sure there's no unintended consequences. But over a period of time, it also can go beyond that brief and act as an oppositional house. And that was a big problem during the Brexit years, as it were, that they started to argue against the elected commons. Um, so what do I feel about being there? I, I just try and use it as a platform for the kind of politics that I've always argued and I made a vow that I would put all of my speeches online I would do a weekly update on what I do in the House of Lords and try and bring it into the public um, discussion more because it's it's very important but not often itself scrutinized by the British public. Right well it's often said uh, that uh, you wouldn't invent or draw up or design the House of Lords today, it's something that's evolved. In Australia's case, we have what we call a Washminster. So we, our, our House of Representatives closely modelled on your uh, House of the Commons. Uh, and our upper house is like the American Senate because we're a federation. So each of the states and the territories have representation. They're quite different, but it's become politicised rather than a House of Elders, in my view. So I guess we can all criticise our own approaches. But anyway, um, yeah. turning to the turmoil in British politics at the moment, we've seen Boris Johnson um, resign. I'd be very interested in your views, firstly, on what you think his legacy in your country will be, 
And then secondly, we might come to what it means globally. But firstly, what do you think it means for Britain? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing to assess, but I suppose we have to go back a little, which is that the um, period after uh, the UK voted to join the European Union, the problem was, was that there was a vote, people voted to leave, but there was a gathering of establishment forces that prevented that from occurring for years. And it honestly got to the point where those of us who had voted to leave the EU believed it wasn't going to happen. There was so many obstacles being put in its place and there was a great disillusion. The largest democratic vote that had ever occurred in the United Kingdom was being thwarted. So Boris Johnson's legacy was that he uh, took over the Conservative Party at a time when the Conservatives realised that if they didn't do something to save Brexit, that they would be destroyed as a party. They had lost and been humiliated badly in a European election. And so in, in the UK terms, his fame was that he not only won that election on the basis of getting Brexit done, but he, he, not he personally, but he represented a real shakeup of British politics because for the first time, people who for generations and generations had voted Labour voted Conservative. Not because they'd become Conservative, but because they believed Boris Johnson would honour their vote and get Brexit done. So this, of course, threw British politics into turmoil and gave Boris Johnson a huge majority. Now his untimely demise, what people will say is that he squandered that large majority and didn't make the most of the promise of Brexit as a democratic project. But right from the get go, there were people who hated Boris Johnson's huge majority because it represented Brexit. And there's still a lot of antagonism around that. We then had COVID and lockdown, and that created a lot of tension because, as with every administration around the world, civil liberties were dispensed with. So here we have a kind of liberal prime minister who locks society down and closes down the economy. So that led to tensions. And I think we can safely say that Boris Johnson didn't do himself any favours because he took that huge mandate, it seems to me, as an entitlement to behave irresponsibly and sometimes without any regard for the promises that were made to the British people. But at the moment, there's still a lot of people who say Boris Johnson should not have been deposed in that way by the commentariat, by, you know, um, by the political establishment, even by his own colleagues, um, because they feel that that was undemocratic and it would be better to have left that to the voters. That's a common theme. We've seen that emerge in Australia when political parties have changed leaders and the, and, and the electorate. There's been quite a strong feeling, hey, that was our job. It was up to us to decide whether we yeah. wanted that person yeah. to continue. Yeah. Um, so tell me, to come to the global side then, uh, there's a very great interest, of course, uh, in, in, in what Britain does in Australia, not only because of our historic ties, but because Britain is a major player, uh, you know, uh, still a global leader in many ways, still a quite a powerful nation militarily, nowhere near as powerful as it was once. But in an unstable time, uh, Boris Johnson was seen to understand Australia, to understand Asia, to see the concerns around China and its aggression. Uh, and of course, uh, he was uh, militarily prepared to deploy naval presence, uh, including uh, one of your new aircraft carriers to uh, the east. And to broker AUKUS, uh, which uh, is a new security deal, uh, which will include Australia in such things as nuclear technology for submarine powered, uh, nuclear powered submarines. Uh, so what do you think his global impact might be? Tease that out for a moment, uh, or legacy. Well, I, I don't think we, yeah, I don't think we're seeing any substantial shift in terms of international affairs from the people who at the moment are scrambling to take over from him. I mean, this isn't a change of government as such, even if it has, it will inevitably have a change of style, but I don't, 
I don't know that that legacy will be uh, disrupted, as it were. I mean, there's there's a lot of um, criticism of the UK government's policies in relation to Australia, but that's again from people. Well, just to use Australia as an example, because there's always this sort of sense that this idea of global Britain, which was the, the meant to be what came out of, um, instead of being uh, in the European Union, although the accusation was that this would lead to a little Englander approach, many people who voted leave wanted to have the notion of a global Britain, you know, that you weren't confined to simply being part of the EU. And therefore, the people who don't like Brexit tend to be critical of any international deals done. And until recently, um, associated the Australian government with the far right, because everybody's the far right these days. You know, if you don't like them, you describe them as the far right. You, you, I'm, this trend is well and truly alive in Australia too, isn't it? Which is yeah. you kind of try and demonise people. Yeah. And so it... There was this sort of notion that Boris Johnson and the far right government in Australia, you know, and um, and I, I'm, I, this is these aren't my sentiments. I'm making the point that the criticism of Boris Johnson was from outside of the Conservative Party when it came to those kind of international deals. So I don't think I mean, the world the world is, as you know, in, in if British politics was realigning in the way I described international and geopolitics are realigning as we speak. Nothing to do with Boris Johnson. And I think how the next prime minister of the UK handles that and deals with that will be very important. But I think it's a challenge for every government around the world because we're in uncertain times. We no longer can go back. The Cold War arrangements are over. We have new tensions and um, I don't I haven't as yet seen any evidence of the UK resiling from that or trying to get out of its international commitments. Can I just um, tease out what you said? That's interesting, isn't it? Uh, you make the comment that the, the, the conservatives, if there's such a beast anymore, uh, are often now painted as far right. And yet the conservative base in Australia would say the Morrison government lacked conservative conviction. It lacked a willingness to stand up for things like free speech and, uh, you know, the, the traditional family values and so forth of conservative forces. One of Australia's foremost uh, uh, writers, Paul Kelly at the Australian newspaper, wrote that conservatives worldwide are seen now to be abandoning their normal commitment to character and integrity and honesty and that Johnson failed the character test as well as the test of statecraft. Uh, so there's this sort of almost, I mean, I think he went on to say um, uh, that um, we're seeing this worldwide and he refers to Trump and what have you. Do you think there's a real breakdown in, in any coherent or deep political philosophy going on here anyway, right across the board? Yes. I mean, that's the that's the answer. I, I, but first of all, I think that the the left and right labels have become increasingly unhelpful. I'm historically from the left. Um, but even in this country now, if you argue for a non-compromising commitment to free speech, you're considered to be somehow suspect as though the only reason you want free speech is so that you can spout hate speech that somehow you're involved. I mean, you know, the, 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 the hyperbole in describing political opponents is so great that you can be accused of being kind of proto-fascist because you support free speech and um, without restriction. So we've lost a sense of, in the meantime, as you pointed out, we've actually got in many countries a technocratic political establishments with very little philosophical depth with a real shallow approach to principle. And it makes it very difficult because all that it means is that we're, we're trading name calling and you know demonizing each other. But actually the, the really important differences of philosophical approach to the future or to technology or industry or freedom or any of these things are somehow lost in this kind of shouting match, which is quite tribal. 
So I do think there's a real problem. And I think that the, you know, the criticism and, you know, because you were asking me about Boris Johnson's legacy, my criticism would be that he 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 did indeed squander what what, could, what he could have done with that huge majority because he actually flitted around with very little indication of a philosophical commitment to anything. And it can't all be just COVID's fault because you're in the middle of COVID when, you know, you could say this is a virus, it's nothing to do with him, it's just unlucky. The UK kind of boasted, the Conservative Party in the United Kingdom, its big boast, its claim to fame was that they held COP26 and they talked about the environment the whole time and eco targets and net zero it had become a mantra. Now, I considered that to be a really uh, retrograde, regressive uh, philosophical outlook that will hold back economic development um, is actually going to cause and has caused major problems in terms of energy uh, um, create the creation of reliable cheap energy for for uh, people in in Britain but in other words they just kind of latched onto that as though that was a kind of philosophy of any meaning but you know it's almost like a fashionable fad so you get my drift or I hope that I'm saying conservatism as it was ever understood but also this would be true of people on the left they just seem to have emptied out of very much meaning and what i think the hard work of politics is at the moment is for those of us who care about ideas and actually care about genuinely uh, getting through a very challenging period we have to work harder and come up with some new ideas and new philosophies that are suitable for the contemporary period we live in because to tease out a little of, uh, of that um, lack of philosophical commitment or consistency might be the better word. Uh, as I understand it, Boris Johnson was a great climate change sceptic only quite recently. And then all of a sudden, as you say, you had this dramatic conversion, which Europe's now already, we haven't noticed it much in this country, you haven't learned the lessons, but they're having to backtrack all over the place. I find it astonishing to learn that, you know, they're reopening coal-fired power stations uh, even talking about committing to new fossil fuel exercises in all sorts of ways. Uh, gas is now seen as a green source of energy across Europe. You've had this massive walking back. And so what is the voter to think of this consistent inconsistency or ad hocery? Well, I mean, the, the irony is that the voters are not consulted. I was shocked when I went in the House of Lords. I mean, I didn't really know what it would be like. And as you say, it has this sort of notional idea of these kind of elders or wise people, or, you know, these kind of baronesses and lords. And, you know, I, I can't believe I'm actually one of them. Anyway, and I went in, it was like being in a student <laughs> union. I mean, everybody was into identity politics. They spouted all of this kind of green dogma the whole time. If you challenged it, you were accused of being a climate denier. You know, we, we're, we're all familiar with these tropes. And there was no kind of discussion at all. And But of course, these have real consequences for people because although you're saying there's a bit of rowing back, and of course, in the middle of an energy crisis, there are going to be things that will be done. But that that's just, uh, you know, philosophically it's all over the place because that then appears to make it seem like it never meant anything anyway but i mean in this country there is a target that every house must get rid of its gas boiler and replace it with a heat pump boiler which will be very expensive to install and there's a target for you know in 10 years time or something and uh it's going to be very expensive your house won't be as warm it'll be very expensive to install nobody wants one this has never been voted on, and this is in order to reach our net zero targets. The voters, if I, when I, in the House of Lords, have asked questions such as, well, you know, lots of voters don't want this, right? This is, what about the public? They say, it's up to us as the government to bring the voters with us and persuade them. So this is a top-down policy, anti-democratic, a set of uh, targets that they are going to meet regardless of what people want democratically 
And of course, these are the kind of debates that we were having around being in the European Union, that people said, no, we want to decide on policy. We want to have a democratic say. So the irony is that this uh, green agenda is very much, again, cutting the public out, doing what is in the best interest of the public, if only they knew what was in their best interest, but the elites know best. And of course, it's had catastrophic impacts on energy production. So this is a, a worldwide phenomenon, but it, it does mean that when you look at the, again, the Boris Johnson legacy, people started to become very suspicious then, you know, well, I thought you were the guy that was gonna, you know, transform um, and democratize British society in a new way and bring the voters, you know, into discussions. And now you're kind of telling us we've got to do these ridiculous, we can't drive, we can't do this, you know, and so on and so forth. I think what it shows us is that there's a, an empty vessel uh, amongst those uh, many, many of the, the, the politicians around the world haven't got much. And they grasp onto these very fashionable causes and trying to fill them up. And of course, we've seen that it's not just the political classes that do that. But even major corporates do the same. So, you know, every corporate is, instead of concentrating on, you know, creating uh, the products to sell and making that the focus, they want to prove their worthiness, their moral worth, their environmental and their social commitment. And, and, and it, it makes a mockery of ideas in a way. They just become the sort of flags that you you know like you on twitter where you kind of put your your symbols it's entirely performative and i think it's really degraded what people consider political life to be like i couldn't agree with you more frankly i really get what you're saying it seems to me that in our country maybe there i think there are parallels right across the west that there was a time when the parliaments were full of people in this country it fell into three broad categories conservatives liberals in the classic sense of the word, and social democrats, or what the Europeans might call Christian democrats, that each of them had an ideal. We think Australia should look like this. So every policy issue that came along was looked at through the lens of, does it take us towards that vision of Australia or away from it? And then you had a common language, if you like, with those who disagreed with you you could frame it in terms of, no, it takes us towards your vision of Australia, which we disagree with. We want to go in this direction, and here's why this particular policy works for it or against it. But that's broken down, and now we get this sort of short-termism, this opportunism, this ad hocery, and it raises the question of where to now? You talked about identity politics. In a way, that fracturing represents what's happened to our societies, I suspect. We are very divided. We don't identify together as Australians or as British or even as members of the sort of Western Liberal Alliance or whatever it is. Rather, I identify with my group. I am a champion of the planet and I will save it. And if you dare to disagree with me, you're the problem. How do we work our way through this? I know you've said a bit about this being a time when we can't tell where we're going. But what are your what are, what are your sort of thoughts on it? Well, I mean, I think you know, I really you know, I can the work that I've done as the director of the Academy of Ideas is more who I identify with than I do as as um, uh, a member of the House of Lords. And I and I, I, I and what we've tried to do is well, first of all, one of the things is that I think we all have an obligation to try and rebuild the public square. Yeah, because. I, this is, a, you know, at the moment, the public square is often social media, but what, what's left of it is so curtailed by, I find that offensive, you know, you can't say that, and, and the, the, the uh, tribalism of, of, of not engaging with each other, people in their own echo chambers. So I think that, I don't, I'm not saying I know how to do it, but we try and do it through lots of big events that we organise, try and get people from all sides, these kind of you know, I uh, think uh, with some success, but in a modest way. But I think that one needs to have that as an aspiration. But secondly, I mean, I, I know it, it really does sound stupid when you say you've got to work hard, but you know, we, we've got to kind of like in, read a few books. We've got to be a bit, bit 
um, modest about what we know and, and, and realize we live in a very new period. And those of us who, uh, and, and I agree completely with your, with your points about the, the historically, that's what you offered people, wasn't it? Two different visions, but of Australia, you know, hmm. or three or four or whatever. But you, you agreed that you were having competing visions of the same country, broadly speaking, say, I think we can get there this way. No, we can get it there this way, right? At the moment, I think we've even lost a sense of what the vision is. So I know it sounds really silly to say you've got to read books, but just to use an example, because I'm reading a book. So I'm reading, not one book, but I'm reading this book, Richard Lackman, First Class Passengers and the Sinking Ship, which is actually about elite politics and the decline of the great powers. I don't agree with lots of it, but it's fascinating and I'm learning from it and I'm thinking when I'm reading it. and. Uh, I'm afraid that um, I, I, this is partly because I've just been having this discussion on an, on an, at, on another podcast. Um, I, I, I do feel as though we we have lost. Risk. I don't feel as though we're all we're putting each other under enough intellectual pressure to come up with new ideas. I mean, even those of us who are on the free speech side, you know, in this country, it drives me mad that it's kind of woke versus anti woke. And if I think that. I, I, do you use those phrases in Australia? Is that the phrases? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, people say to me all the time, what does this word woke mean? Well, it's actually an African-American term that means you've been awakened to the truth and the truth tends to, right. well, essentially it's critical theory, isn't it? It's critical race yeah. theory, critical gender theory. Um, uh, but it, it's come to encapsulate a whole, almost a, a sort of a faith list of things you must embrace that are all essentially divisive. Yeah, it's terrible, right? But then in reaction to it, you then kind of get an anti-woke reaction that can be equally crass yeah. and equally uh, tribal and equally end up in its own echo chamber. So I'm on the anti-woke side, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but I think we've got, to, or we've got to walk our game, right? Is what I'm trying to say. So there are no easy answers to what you've just said, and I'm being hopeless. I actually think that even internationally, there's got to be uh, networks of people, I don't mean World Economic Forum. I mean, there's got to be networks of people who are, are thinking similarly. We've got to work out how to deal with what do we think about geopolitics? What do we think now about uh, economic development in the present circumstances? Philosophically, how are we going to win the arguments for freedom again? Uh, in the, at the Academy of Ideas, we, over lockdown, launched a series of pamphlets called Letters on Liberty. And they're, they're just little pamphlets. They're very good, but they're not just. But they're just two and a half thousand word pamphlets. Um, and the reason we did it is because we recognise that you can't say to everybody any longer that censorship, and I believe in free speech, quote J.S. Mill and hope you can win the argument that new generations have to find new ways of arguing for freedom. We have to go beyond just saying, oh, you're a censor. You know, you have to go into these issues. So I, I just think you've got to use every opportunity and all opportunities to create a new um, battle of ideas terrain so that we, we stand a chance of winning over the, what I'm passionate about is young people who were completely disorientated by these people, and there's no adults in the room. Half of the adults are behaving like they're, they're chasing after young people. You know, they spend most of their time telling Greta Thunberg how wonderful she is, and doing mea culpas about history, and saying, oh yes, we hate our history, we hate the UK, everything in the past is terrible, we can learn from you. And that's actually not flattering the young, it's abandoning them yes. because it doesn't give them any leadership whatsoever. It, it's a, it allows them to have their prejudices just simply never challenged. So. I agree with that uh, very strongly. And part of the point of these conversations that uh, I conduct uh, and I'm learning so much from you in this one um, uh, is, is, is to try and, you know, get people thinking again because there are a lot of people now, you've made the point, and I agree with you, that the old sort of left-right division is pretty meaningless. And I'm not quite sure what you substitute. 
But maybe Anne Hersiali was onto something when she says we're in danger of becoming emocracies, where we emotionally respond to everything on the basis of feelings and short-term sort of personal responses, rather than democracies where we you know, work through the collective will on an intelligent and thoughtful basis. Maybe the division now is between reason and emotion, do you think, in part? Definitely in part, yes. And I think that part of that emotionalism is also that we've developed a therapeutic approach to society. And I think that this partly explains why so many young people interpret the challenges of growing up, the challenges of life, through the prism of mental health, because they, they, they've been given this kind of therapeutic language. I mean, everything is seen to be traumatic or creating stress or anxiety, and they're not being given the tools by us to be resilient because the emotionalism, you know, if, if, you, if you want, it's, it's become a real cultural worth to be a victim who suffered Yes. Right. If, if you if you've got that, you, 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 you can you can you can almost like gain an entry into society and silence any opposition because you'll say I as a victim of, you know, I as a woman find that offensive. And as a victim of so and so, you can't say that it's a way of just closing down debate. But it also means that people are not able to use their reason to critique each other because they're shut out by this emotional lived experience you know trump card so i agree with you on emotionalism and and uh, the points you're making but i also i also think that um there are certain things that we know that we should well i think they're very important i mean i think that we are in danger of developing a kind of historic amnesia and i think we one of the things that certainly happened in the UK, I mean, history is highly contested in all Western countries at the moment. And I think that there's a danger of being too defensive. If, if you constantly see the past as a site of problems and, um, you know, is the, everything from, um, I'm, I'm cr crassly going to say, you know, removing statues and constantly seeing everything that's been achieved through the, uh, the, the prism of uh, uh, exploitation, slavery, all of these things. You never really get to you never really get to grips with um, where we are in local. People become histor historically illiterate. They can't work out where we are in relation to a historical uh, period. So I think we've got to reclaim history. That that's one thing. I don't think you can have any sense of the future if you're trapped in a sort of form of presentism, you know, where the past is just like dire and awful and you can't touch it. And the future is described in the most apocalyptic terms because we're all going to, you know, we're all going to burn in, we're all, and the future is viewed pessimistically. I mean, this is a terrible legacy for inspiring young people, isn't it? It's like awful. Yeah, I think it's truly frightening. And we know from the research that uh, young people right around the world have climate change anxiety. Now, there's nothing wrong with being concerned about issues. That's important. Right, right, yeah. But it's reached the point where, you know, we now keep reading about young men who are having vasectomies. They don't want to bring children into this terrible world. In fact, Frank Peruti from your country made the observation in a brilliant piece uh, uh, published in an Australian newspaper that these attacks on history look like attacks on history uh, in the first instance, but in reality... What they're designed to do is to convince our young people that they are inheriting such a nightmarish culture and that they have such a bleak future that they become despondent and don't want to defend the people, the institutions, even the thinking behind the institutions that have given us the very freedoms that you've touched on, like freedom of speech. 200 years ago, you didn't have a lot of right to free speech in England. It was hard won and often for minorities. They were the people who benefited. It wasn't the majority. And now we have people saying, oh, free speech is just so the culturally you know, uh, dominant uh, conservatives, which is a nonsense today, can oppress the rest of us. It's nuts. Um, well, I think, yeah, I mean, I think, I think Friday's right on, on, on that. And I, but I, I, I don't think it's like, 
it's almost like not a plan, but that's certainly the consequence. And you made the point about a kind of cultural pessimism that means that we have a situation where people say, well, we can't have children because you're bringing them into this terrible world with rampant racism, um, with, you know, with, with, which we're irresponsibly destroying the planet where, and, and all of these things. And I, I think what, what we're talking about here is a particular layer of society, because I suppose one of the things that's still very true in the UK is that there is a class difference here, right? Because a lot of the time, these are the preoccupations of an educated class, educated, formally at least. And for many working people, they just it just feels like a completely self-indulgent set of ideas. If you think about the notion of white privilege, I mean, we've just been in a situation in this country where there's a report that came out this week about um, uh, grooming gangs in Telford in, 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 in North of England, um, in which thousands of young women have been abused. I mean, the report admits that thousands of young women have been abused for decades, not just abused, I mean, raped, savagely abused. But because those young women were white working class girls, and because the grooming gangs were effectively Asian men, nobody wanted to touch it. So the authorities abandoned those young women because they were frightened that it would stir up racial hatred. So the young women were just abandoned. I mean, it's unbelievable. Now this is, it, the Telford report is all like, you know, it, it, it also happened in Rotherham and all the rest of it. And even as I'm saying this, I'm anxious because you immediately think, I'm not a racist. I mean, you know, you don't know how to deal with it. But this is factually true. The police have now made, said, sorry, we should have intervened. Social services have apologized. But this has been going on in our midst. And the reason I'm saying that is because that does seem to me, at the same time that's going on, all the universities in the UK are talking about white privilege. Well, you know, not for those girls, right? Not, not for those white working class girls in, in, in those northern towns. They didn't have much privilege. In other words, there's a real mismatch between the real lives of ordinary people. And that's where I'd say the green thing goes wrong because people are just going, you know, you're telling me, um, you know, that I've got the most important thing is net zero and I can't afford to heat my home. You know what I mean? Like, what? what? Yeah. There's a, just a, this massive gap. And that alienation, that inability for political parties of all sides to have any kind of a relationship or even conversation with people is, I think, really what is the crisis in democratic countries at the moment. I don't know whether the old parties are fit for purpose. I don't think they are. A lot of the new parties that emerge are pretty useless or they can't, they're not breaking through. So I don't know what's going to happen. I've got no predictions. But I will tell you now that it's not resolvable. There's no happy centrist middle that's going to emerge and just we'll all go back to normal that those those days are gone I, I suspect you're right let's tease this issue out a little bit the the public disengagement if you like from the political process um in a conversation with um, uh, lord sumption in your country only recently uh he made the point that if you go back to the 50s and 60s both the labor party and the Conservatives had massive popular membership. I think well over a million for the Labor Party, somewhere around two million for the Conservatives. People were engaged. Local branches was, of each party were strong and people went out and argued the issues and there was a lot of passion, a lot of engagement. And I think he made the comment to the, or made a comment to the effect that the, uh, the, the major bird watching association in Britain now has more members than the political parties combined. Um, this raises the issue of populism, doesn't it? I mean, one man's populism is another man's poison. Uh, you could say that Boris Johnson heard the, both led and heard the British people on sovereignty in the case of Brexit, but the experts would say, no, he was a populist. Where does the line uh, you know, really lie between populism and genuine, consultative, interactive democracy, do you think, Claire? Well, I mean, I, the problem with the word populism is it's just used as an insult now. 
It's, yeah. It's used very insultingly. Uh, um, what they what they usually mean is that you're popular. Populism is. Um, uh, I mean, I uh, so first of all, I I've now uh, basically embraced the term and just say, well, okay, I'm a populist then, because they're usually attacking you for having any democratic instinct. Yeah. As far as I can see. Um, I mean, and I and I know that, you know, I myself ridicule populism when it means just crassly, you know, doing things in an opportunistic way to f win favour with the electorate. But actually, what the critique of populism is, why have all these voters gone out and voted the wrong way, right? So they yeah. kind of can't, it's, a, it's an attempt at explaining what happened in America, you know, the, the kind of 2016 events. But it's also only recently, you know, great sigh of relief when Macron got, uh, in France, got voted as president. Everyone was like, oh, great, we can go back to normal. And then a few weeks later, <laughs> There was these other elections and Macron did very badly and there's Le Pen. In other words, the political parties that we have are not able to contain the aspirations of millions of people and they're finding different ways of expressing their frustration with mainstream politics, it seems to me. And that's what the uh, is routinely described as populism as a way of discrediting uh, those, those instincts. Um, and by the way, way Boris Johnson can take no claim for Brexit he, he he was just part of it and I and I know I keep going back to that but that's what was so extraordinary the political parties have got very little in the way of membership at the moment in the way you described in the UK this uh, referendum was called in 2016 I personally thought it was going to it, you know people would be disinterested in it the government was in a panic because David Cameron called it and thought nobody would vote in it. I mean, there was, a, you know, there was a lot of Eurosceptics who were interested, but it was a minority, you know. And, and, and the way that the government dealt with it, which is ironic in the circumstance, was they came up with this wheeze of telling everyone this is a once in a generation vote. Right. This is the first time that each and every vote in this country will count. You know, it's not first past the past. It's just lit your vote will make a difference. And it sort of captured the imagination of the British public. And also the people who never voted before. I mean, you'd, you'd literally walk around, people were arguing over it at bus stops, at the, you know, the, at, at uh, the school, you know, the school gates, uh, families were having family conferences, people who were not interested in politics were having long discussions because they were told that by the government of the day, we're trusting you with a major constitutional decision about whether we should be in the European Union or not. And it, what happened was it, it kind of brought everybody to life. So it's a very exciting period. Now, you don't often, this isn't often reported by the media because they missed the moment, which is why they got such a shock when the majority voted to leave the European Union because they were looking somewhere else, right? Yeah. They thought it was... and. and and there was a palpable shock. So I think that when you talk about, um, you know, what's happened to the parties, what I'm saying is the energy that was associated with political parties in the past has found itself, ex ex has been expressed internationally now in different ways, right? We're seeing it in all sorts of populist rebellions. And I, I, I would prefer, of course, it to be organised around clear cut political parties in a straightforward way but I, I but I don't ask people to shut up and quell their demand their, their their aspiration to want to be involved in the future of society because it doesn't suit my agenda I mean it's not going to happen that that as it were the the the, the genie's out of the bottle now I'd just like to explore a little more what you think might be the price of this this level of disengagement in the community I think I heard you say very recently that you suspect that the next election which in which voting is not compulsory in Britain it is in Australia you'll have a lower turnout than ever because of this disengagement and my fear is that that empowers the expertocracy if I can use that word those who think look we know how to run your lives 
Uh, you mightn't want us to go so far down the climate change road, but we're going to take you there anyway because that's good for you. And that just exacerbates a sense of disengagement uh, and, and, and increases the likelihood of another boil over of the sort that you saw in America in 2016, where you know people miss the point, it seems to me, that Trump was not so much the problem as the, um, the result of the problem. Yeah, I mean, I think Trump and to a certain extent Boris Johnson became in different ways the vehicles through which people express something. You know, they, it, people miss it because there's too, so much emphasis on personality and also this kind of rather crass <coughs> critique of, um, a crass critique of a kind of populism led by some demagogue. You know, that's like the way people like to understand it, usually opponents of, 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 of these kind of democratic revolts. They, the only way they can see it is this kind of like ignorant sheep like people following some great leader. And I don't think it's that at all. And you're right. You know, these were just expressions of something. Not that, you know, it's not that, that, that it wasn't that Trump was such a great leader. Right. I mean, that wasn't what happened. Right. Um, anyway, to move to what's likely to happen, I, I don't want there to be no one voting in the next election. Well, you can't blame people when the, the choices are so uninspiring. I, I think it, it will demobilize people politically, but it will just drive it under the surface. And that's dangerous, right? For all of us, because it's not resolved. These issues are not resolved. So you'll just have a seething fury, which is not good. Because one would want to turn that into a constructive, optimistic project of, for example, rebuilding the country after COVID or taking on the challenges uh, thrown up by uh, the uh, Ukraine war or the energy crisis or the recession or any of these things. But if people just feel, well, what's the point? This is very dangerous. But I'm afraid that there's not much sign of people being inspired by the present political parties. So I think that I try, I try and see it as ensuring that that's why I said to you about rebuilding the public square so that the public square and politics is not simply reduced to who you vote for, but yeah. it becomes a much richer uh, space in which you can engage people positively and use reason and argue for the importance of reason and encourage people to read and debate and discuss so that they're not just kind of forced into a nihilistic rabbit hole of hating everybody and not believing anyone and thinking everything is is, is conspiring against them. So that's the challenge of our age, it seems to me. As a subset of that, I think you recently said that the British civil service, we'd call it the public service in Australia, had become something of a sort of kingdom under itself. Um, you know, that it's often uh, refusing to follow government directives. We had the impression here that the civil service were not prepared and not prepared to work hard on uh, the whole Brexit thing, uh, you know, making it happen, uh, for example. Um, and they act almost as though... Uh, uh, it has the authority to, or they have the authority to determine whether the government itself is legitimate. I suspect that's going to be a part of the problem going forward, to go back to this idea that that, that um, there are people who know what's best for you. It's not you yourself. We know best. What happened to the famed British public service, or am I overestimating the problem? No, I actually think you're underestimating it because it's not just the civil service. And I mean, there are at least there is at least a debate about this now. And there are people who are trying to organize, you know, internal training for civil service. You know, there's an, at least an attention being paid to this. But no, we've had I mean, it, it wasn't that they were reluctant to implement Brexit. I mean, they actively wouldn't do it. <laughs> it's like so, but they did have the backup of lots of their own bosses who were politicians who also didn't want to do it. But we've had recently this example where the Home Office do not like the refugee scheme that the government came up with, which is the what's known as the Rwanda scheme of, 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 of deporting uh, refugees to the UK to Rwanda. 
No, I don't like it either, as it happens, right? But if you're a civil servant and you work for the Home Office, you're meant to do what you're told. You're not meant to say, we're not doing that, right? Yeah. There was like a rebellion internally in the civil service. But it's also the institutions, because I think one of the, the things which you recognise is that the institutions themselves, you know, the universities, the museums, the... Um, the, the scientific establishment, and this was very clear around the Brexit years, as I say, not about Brexit, but around that time, was there was like suddenly you found out, oh, this is who the establishment are, right? These people run society and they basically have utter contempt for the British people. <laughs> and they were open about it. I mean, they didn't even disguise the sort of sneering attitude of the uneducated uh, uh, voting the wrong way, making the wrong decisions, didn't know what was in their best interest. And I think that's a real shame because these wonderful institutions, you know, the British Museum, the VNA, the National Trust, are, are, are the people who work there are entrusted with these fantastic, historic, important uh, uh, um, institutions. And then you find out that quite a, a lot of people who work there hate them. Yeah. They hate the British. They hate that. They hate the UK's past. And they're not interested in looking after the treasures of the past. They're like almost destructive. But there's a battle that goes on there. And of course, this is where free speech comes in. The problem is, is that, for example, were you to be the kind of person who thinks that decolonizing the British Museum is a ridiculous notion, the problem is, if you said that, you could then be cancelled and called a racist and in and and so on. So we have to make sure that um, these uh, really savage attacks at silencing any dissent are, are eradicated. So I, I, I think that this is why the problem is not just the politicians, you know, it's much deeper than that. It's across, there's a kind of crisis, institutional crisis of the West in, in, in that sense. I, I agree with you. I agree with you very strongly. Um, can I ask you, uh, as we round this out, you've been very generous with your time, but one of the things I've noticed is a surprising number of people now, thinkers and contributors to the debate across the world, had a sort of radical Marxist background, but they've moved to a more libertarian position um, uh, and sometimes even to conservative positions. Um, I think I would want to argue, well, they're people who have been genuinely engaged in thinking the issues through. And that thinking has led them to a different place. But would you have any observations on, on, on why there are many people who, who once were associated with a quite hard left who have moved to a very distinctly different position uh, as, if you like, the cultures moved perhaps further left in the, in the old language? Well, that, that's the problem is that I, I, I feel as though I haven't moved that far, but the culture's gone mad. Right. See what I mean, like I always believed in free speech. I mean, how did that become a right wing position? It's ridiculous. So, I mean, I feel like well, the same position on free speech for a long time, but somehow, um, whereas it was perfectly acceptable to have that position as a left winger in the past, I'm now considered to be right wing because I hold it now. Well, I didn't change my position. The world changed around me. But of course, you're asking a more serious question and I'm being a bit glib. I think that um, Possibly. I mean, I don't know whether your observation is accurate or not, but certainly the new left at the moment, the identitarian left, as it's called, or the, yeah. the, the kind of critical theory left. I mean, I don't recognise anything about them as left wing. I appreciate that they use the rhetoric of social justice. I mean, but who's not into social justice, by the way? But anyway, they use that rhetoric and they use a the language irritatingly for someone like me of anti-racism. You know, somebody has been passionate anti-racist all my life. To hear that language bastardized really um, through the critical race theory and, and, uh, and, and racialized by seeing people through the prism of, of ethnicity and skin color rather than judging people by the character, their character to, to of course, use that, frame, that famous uh, way of expressing it. These things are, are understandable that people think that's the left. So why would somebody on the hard left from the past end up there? I, I, partly it's, I think, um, that Marxism in particular 
um, encouraged me, but it, 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 was a, it was a dissident philosophical outlook, but it, but it meant you had to really think about the world you lived in. Yeah. I mean, some, no doubt some people just fashionably joined, became lefties, but actually I, I read a huge amount. I, I was encouraged to think about challenge, you know, orthodoxy, think about them. So that if you want, I kind of had a good training, critical thinking. That's that's one thing. I didn't just, you know, to question things and to to not just go along with them. And also, I, I also happen to think that we probably had a lot of name calling over the years, and so we got, got quite hardened to the um, the attempts at cancelling us. So we probably there's a bit of that that goes on. But on the libertarian point, I mean, I'm often described as a left wing libertarian. Uh, well, I've never used the expression that I'm a libertarian. I think the word libertarian is a bit muddled to me. I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm much more of a, a classical liberal with a left wing bent, right? I mean, I, but you know, libertarian is used in a very. In other words, what I think um, is that as a Marxist, I believed in liberty and individual liberty, and what people misunderstand about the, the Marxism as a philosophical outlook, forget anything else, um, all, uh, is that it, it, it centered around the history making individual being free, right? You know, wasn't, people think, oh, it's a collective, everybody has to agree. That was never what it was. It was about believing in agency and the autonomy of individuals to, 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 to make their world, right? Nobody knows what I'm talking about. In other words, these are old labels. So I don't, I don't, I, I, I'm not being rude, but trying to explain my Marxist roots um, it feels like a, it's not going to help anyone. So I now don't care what people label me. I mean, what whether I'm left or right, I don't care. I, 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 I object when people try and call me a bigot because I, for example, um, defend uh, a definition of a biological woman rather than the uh, the gender critical version, or if they call me a, a xenophobe or a racist because I chose to leave the European Union or any of these things. But in terms of the left right labels, I just think they've ended up being past their sell by date, and we should start again. Not in a not in a year zero way, but I think if we agree. Who cares what our historic background is? If we agree on this big issue or that big issue, and the big issues for me are free speech is the fundamental one. You can't change anything without that. And also on individual agency, the capacity for adults to make choices without being treated like children and infantilized by the state or by anyone else for that matter. These things are... And I think you can be left or right historically and believe in them if you'll fight for them. Um, and that's what we've got to do. We've got to reclaim these very important concepts. Claire, you've been very generous with your time. Uh, I've, uh, I've really enjoyed it. I think you've given us fantastic content and a lot to think about because I couldn't agree with you more. We have got to learn to think and to interact at the level of some degree of respect and civility if we're to find our way forward. So I, um, I thoroughly enjoyed it and I, I hope our listeners will as well. So do I. Thank you very much.